we uh, we put the stuff on a truck and it's gone into storage and then eventually when we have a place to bring it we will uh, we'll unpack it but right now it's in storage we're looking for a house okay but you guys live in a dorm now right yes in a dorm <laughs> apartment just okay. like the incoming kind students it's great <laughs> Please greet Rob. I will. I will. Yeah. yeah, please. please. Everyone as well. I like imagining that you operate out of like a mini fridge now. Like a mini nah, fridge. Not quite, little... but the kitchen is too small for both of us to be in at the same time. It's like the Barbie dream kitchen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How did your uh, parrot fare with uh, the plane ride? She did great. She didn't utter a peep the whole time. I think she was terrified. Yeah. But she rode between us on the empty seat in her little carrier, and then take off and landing, she went under the seat. <laughs> yeah, she was good. All right, it is two o'clock. Everyone who has gathered, well, at least it's two o'clock here in the uh, Pacific time zone. And uh, I'm Pastor Megan Rohr here at Grace Lutheran, and we have been gathering to have some town halls that minimize bias in the Lutheran Church over a series of Fridays since we have been sheltering in place. To date, we have listened to the, the conversations of the Latinx community, some Native folk, uh, Asian and API individuals, uh, individuals with disabilities, people with diverse sexual orientations, and people who are in diverse spaces along the gender spectrum. And uh, we also took some time to listen to some diverse faith leaders within the Lutheran Church, including those in the team program and the Deaconess community. If you'd like to listen to any of those conversations, you can find them at justlutheran.com. We are now in the portion of our town halls where we have switched from listening to what people believe are the biases that exist within our Lutheran context to starting to listen to what some of the best practices are and things that have gone well. Last week, we listened to conversations from some of our interfaith brothers and sisters. And today we have with us a number of bishops, not the only bishops, not encompassing every possible type of diversity, um, speaking for themselves and speaking for the context from which they are in. And hopefully we'll have some additional town halls with some additional bishops. If you are joining us at uh, Zoom on the webinar, you may have noticed that you do not have access to your video or to your microphone during this conversation. We're really seeking to, to listen directly to the voices we have lifted up today and also to decrease the possibility that people will intentionally interfere with our conversations. If you would like to share some of your wisdom, share some of the resources that you have or best practices in your location, you can do that in the chat box. If you have a question for uh, some of the brilliant bishops that are with us today, you can put that in the Q&A section and those will pop up to the, to the top as questions that you can uh, learn more about. I will also be monitoring uh, Twitter and Facebook for folk who are using hashtag Lutherans Listen if they would like to lift up any other questions for this conversation. With that, I wanna just acknowledge that being recorded and being a part of a town hall like this is a bit of a leap of faith. 
and I want to give people permission to accidentally say the wrong word every once in a while, um, that if there are technology hiccups, that that is the Holy Spirit living and dwelling amongst us, and um, that this is just the start of many conversations we'll be having over a period of time. The other thing I wanted to, to name for some people, because we're coming from lots of different uh, cultural contexts and from some different geographies, as we have this conversation, is the reason we're using uh, bias as the frame for these conversations, rather than just looking at racism or just looking at um, sexism or homophobia or transphobia, is because bias is a language that tries to look at the ways that different intersections of our lives affect each other. And it's some of the current academic language that's being, being used to decrease uh, bias, hopefully, with this idea that learning to become better individually and systemically is a lifelong task that we grow towards and that we continuously have to keep doing. And so there's no one who is free of bias. There is just all of us learning to decrease our bias. Um, and so with that, uh, robust introduction. I'd like to turn over today's conversation to Bishop Kevin. Thank you, Pastor Megan. It is a joy to be with each of you and so good to see uh, these uh, dear friends and colleagues uh, in this way spread, spread about uh, literally the whole United States and uh, thank God for technology that we can see each other even in this way. Um, we're going to go through just a couple of questions in a minute, but to start with kind of the more, more important thing right now is to tell folks, uh, uh, who do you say you are? Um, kind of echoing our upcoming gospel for this coming Sunday. Uh, but uh, please share your name, your context, and some of the intersections you embody, um, and how do any of these intersections affect your faith? Uh, so I'll start. Uh, I'm Kevin Strickland. Um, and I use uh, he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I serve as the Bishop of the Southeastern Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Uh, what that means is that uh, the territory in that Synod is Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Alabama. Uh, we have about uh, 160 congregations spread about those four states, uh, along with some campus ministries and hospitals and uh, other institutions that are a part of our Synod. I have been the bishop now for a year. Uh, prior to that, I served as the assistant to the presiding bishop and executive for worship for the ELCA. Uh, I'm married to my husband, uh, Robbie, uh, who we both live in Atlanta with our mostly adorable French bulldog. Um, part of my uh, intersections are um, I identifying as a gay uh, man uh, who uh, happens to be a pastor who happens to be a bishop in this church uh, and also being from the Deep South and now serving back in the Deep South. Um, and so part of those intersections are being someone who's uh, a religious leader uh, in a context to where being openly gay and a religious leader isn't always necessarily the common thread uh, or the majority in the, that public or private space. Um, and how that affects my uh, personal faith is I identify first and foremost when people ask me, who do I say that I am as a child of God? Uh, and everything from that springs. Uh, so uh, then I talk about where I grew up in South Carolina and my family and my love for my husband and my love for this church and my love for myself, which took me a long time to be able to love that self that God created me and called me to be as an openly gay uh, person. Some other, some other intersections are that uh, uh, age plays a role in my intersection sometimes, especially with the Conference of Bishops. Um, you know, I uh, tend to be on the younger end of our bishops. Uh, Kristen, thank you for being on that, that end with me. Mark and Guy, no uh, offense there. Uh, but that's an intersection. I mean, especially in spaces of leadership in our church where predominantly and historically uh, most have been older white, straight men. Um, so I embody that intersection. Um, all of these intersections, though, uh, also play a part in, in my faith because uh, it helps me articulate, I think, uh, how I identify uh, what I just said, who I am and whose I am uh, as a child of God, and how I interplay with other people, uh, and how I hear and empathize with other people's biases and uh, not to, to always embody 
uh, my own on top of theirs, but to share and empathize the one bi the biases that I've encountered. Um, so Kristen, let's go to you. Please uh, tell us who you are, your context, some of the intersections you embody, and how do you see those intersections affecting your faith? Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm Kristen Kempel. I uh, serve as the Bishop of the Northwest Intermountain Synod, uh, which uh, is mostly made up of Eastern Washington and the state of Idaho, but I also have congregations in Oregon and Wyoming. Uh, so we kind of take up that uh, space between the Cascade and the Rocky Mountains um, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I have been serving in this capacity uh, for three years. When I was elected, I was the youngest woman ever elected to the office of bishop. I was uh, 42. Um, and everyone wondered if I was old enough and mature enough and experienced enough to do this work. Um, I still had children at home when I was elected. I still had elementary school kids. Um, people wondered if being elected at my age would make me a, a bad mother or a bad bishop. Um, I am fairly confident that our colleague, uh, what? Oh, sorry, wrong message. Um, I'm fairly confident our colleague, Eric Gromberg, who was elected the year before I was, and, and I think Eric just turned 40 this year, which means he was elected in his mid thirties. I'm fairly confident he didn't have to address any of those concerns being elected at the age of 36 as a man, as a white man. So that's, you know, that's one of the intersections. I remember the very first conference of bishops meeting um, I attended in fall of 2017, walking into that room on the 11th floor of the Lutheran Center and going, holy shit, that's a lot of old white guys. Um, I was, I was the, the 12th female bishop, um, actively serving female bishop. Um, so there were, I think, 13 of us total in the room um, at that time. We've gotten a lot more um, sister bishops in that, in the three years that I've been serving. And that's been a wonderful change. We're also skewing toward younger bishops being elected, which I think is a, a good change. So there's that intersection of being, you know, like Kevin said, of, of being in leadership um, in a position that has typically not been given to somebody who looks like me. Um, and for some was given reluctantly. Um, there's an intersection. Um, I am a wife and a mother. Um, my two children identify as LGBTQ. Um, and so there's an intersection there because I um, am pretty firmly cis hetero. And so how do I help my kids? Um, navigate this world that has changed so much since I was their age, but also they're engaging with it in a way that I didn't. And so I don't know where the pitfalls are. I don't know how to protect them. Um, the way that this kind of impacts my faith um, is I've had to push really hard uh, to get where I am. Um, I've had to really uh, push to be taken seriously. I've had to push to be heard. I've had to, to push to feel like I had the right to be heard. Um, and so a huge amount of the work that I do, um, or like to think that I do as a bishop, um, is that I use my voice uh, when I can. And this actually, this second piece is more important to me in the work that I do, is I create space for others. Um, and I learned that actually by watching you, Mark. Um, it was my second conference of bishops meeting and we were talking about whether or not it was okay to, to debate or to say something about gun control, right? And, and I serve in a very red area, it is so red. And so many of our, our colleague bishops likewise serve in red areas and they were like, no, we can't come out against, you know, we can't come out in favor of gun control. And, and I happened to be sitting next to Mark and I just leaned over to him and I said, are we actually debating whether or not we should not break the fifth commandment? Is this what we're debating? And he goes, get up to the microphone and say it. And, and I went, no. <laughs> Um, and then I like mustered up my courage and I got up there and I said it. And, and that was the point where I went, this is what a good leader does. 
Um, this is, they empower other voices. They create space for voices that aren't always in the room to be in the room. And so that's, that's a real big part of my call is how do these voices that not, aren't in the room and haven't traditionally been in the room given space in the room. Um, and, and so a lot of times what I identify as um, in that, in my faith is um, kind of a watcher protector. I'm a very protective person. Um, and uh, if, if you are someone I have decided is mine to protect, um, I will do that. Um, and so I see myself as a, as kind of a shepherd, um, I think, um, you know, d protecting people who haven't been protected traditionally by the church, um, and, and helping them find a way that we can work together and make this church what I think God wants it to be, which is not a room full of old white guys. And I, I will say I'm, 100% confident none of the old white guys in that room thinks that that's what the church should look like either. Um, so, you know, I want to I want to be very honest and transparent about that. They think we need to shift to their they want this space for these people and these voices as well. So that's kind of in a nutshell, a big nutshell. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Guy, it's so good to see you, especially after yours and uh, Rob's big move across country and uh, to a new uh, vocation calling. So uh, share uh, your name, who you are, a bit more about yourself, your context, and uh, your, your own intersections you embody and the, how those have affected your own faith. Great. Thank you very much. It is good to be here. Um, my name is Guy Irwin, and I serve as president of the United Lutheran Seminary in Pennsylvania with campuses in Philadelphia, Gettysburg, and online. And uh, I've only been doing this for about three weeks. It's a brand new thing, and we're not even fully settled on the East Coast again yet. Um, I'm married to Rob Flynn, who uh, who is here with me in the in this small apartment while we look for a house. Uh, I served for seven years as Bishop of the Southwest California Synod in Southern California, and was the first uh, openly gay bishop elected in the ELCA. Uh, it's important, of course, to make the distinction that, that there have been plenty of gay people serve in leadership in the church, even as bishops, but that they have not been able to be open about who they were and have not been elected by people who understood them as gay. Uh, so that's, that's really where I, uh, my election marked a new milestone for us. A less remarked upon one, in part because it uh, is not as does not receive as much attention in the church, is that I'm the first person to serve as an as an ELCA bishop who is also the, the citizen of a sovereign native nation, as well as being an American. I'm a member of the Osage Nation in Oklahoma, and was raised there, brought up, and born on the reservation, and and brought up there. And for me, in, in my story of of being part of something and being outside of other things uh, begins with that because I grew up, I'm mixed race, I grew up in a family uh, half of which was Osage and half of which was not. And even growing up and knowing that people whom I loved and to whom I was related uh, had different relationships with being Native. Some were, some weren't. Some were resentful of the fact that others were. Uh, there was racial prejudice even within the network of my own relatives. And, uh, and that was really taught me a great deal about, uh, not only about prejudice, but also about being careful to identify yourself in public ways. It wasn't, of course, until later in life that I also realized I was gay. And being of, a, of an older generation, I'm in my early 60s, and from a context where being gay was not at all accepted, um, I learned very early to be cautious in my self-presentation. These habits that go back deep in our lives, uh, we can't shed them easily. And even now, um, I think that most of the people who, who know me, who get to meet me and don't know anything about me, would probably not assume either that I was gay or that I was Indian. I don't look enough like a conventional Native American for people to, uh, to get that right away. In the context where I come from, of course, there are many people like me 
who don't look particularly Indian, but who are part of the of the nation, and, and we're accepted fully. But there is a a kind of uh, soft racism in the assumption that Indians don't really exist unless they really look like Indians. People will challenge you and say, well, how much Indian are you? To which the answer is, I am as much as it takes to be part of it and be recognized by others as such. Um, so to be, to be in a group that isn't instantly recognizable is a special challenge in itself, but it gives you the freedom to, to disclose as much as you want about, about all this. Of course, as a gay person married, a man married to another man living a public life, it's not really possible to hide. But again, that, uh, that has only really been possible in recent years. So, so I feel like in, in my intersectionality, I also represent a generational change. As, as Bishop Kevin said, he represents a younger cohort. Mine is the one that only was forced into public in the AIDS crisis, in a way. And, and we, have, we have been shaped and formed by that to some degree as well, which has made us cautious people. Um, but the most important vocational intersectionality I think I have, even more than those two, is that I represent the intersection between education and the church. I was a professor of church history before becoming bishop. I've always uh, only done pastoral work on, on a part-time basis up until becoming bishop. And now I'm back in, in the academy, back at one of our seminaries. And though I'm not teaching full-time, my administrative responsibilities center around providing education to a new generation of, uh, of church leaders. And, and I welcome being back in that. I love this atmosphere. And it's in these settings that we expose people to the variety of, of ways of, of being Christian and the variety of ways in which different kinds of people have been Christian. I'll end with one final thing, is that I didn't grow up Lutheran. I came to Lutheranism and, in fact, to Christianity as an adult, as a college student. And so my connection with the church is, is volitional. And it means that I, I took a stand to be part of something that was not already part of me. And that has shaped also the way I look at what it means to be a, a Christian. I, uh, I think it's important for us to, to be committed to what it is we believe. And there is great deal in our Lutheran tradition that is worth committing to. I'm still committed to it. Grateful to be able to be in this conversation with dear colleagues and, and, and with all these very spectators. Thank you so much, guys. Good to hear you and see you. And uh, to your last point there, just to pick up on that, uh, you know, I think we often forget of what you just said, that young adults or even older adults uh, who may never have been Christian at all uh, come to not only Christianity, but to the Lutheran church. Uh, so lest we not forget that and uh, what a gift that is to the church and what an opportunity and an open door, I think we as a denomination uh, really have if we're willing to, to walk into that and lean into that and see that as a great opportunity for not only evangelism, but to meeting people at that intersection that I think could teach the church a whole lot. Uh, Mark, it's good to have uh, your synod be uh, the one who's uh, helpful and responsible for these important conversations. And a special thanks to Pastor Megan for her uh, support of this and her invitation for all of us to participate. I'm, I'm grateful uh, to not only make the time, but take the time with all of you. And uh, prayers, especially for your area of our church as uh, wildfires have been growing rapidly. We certainly have been holding you in prayer. Thank you. So tell us who you are and about uh, uh, your context and intersections that you embody and how that's uh, affected your faith. Sure. I'm Mark Holmrud. I serve as a bishop for our Sierra Pacific Synod, which is all of Central and Northern California and Northern Nevada. So I relate to two of my colleagues here who are multi-state synod bishops. Um, we have 185 congregations. We also have uh, PLTS in our territory. Um, and our Mount Cross Bible Camp in Felton, which is right now very near uh, one of the fire areas and a number of other ministries that are very active and we're very involved with. Um, I, um, I, I have been bishop for 12 plus years. In another reality, I would be 21 days into retirement right now. 
Um, but because of COVID, our Senate Council made the decision to postpone our assembly until next spring, um, hoping that we might be able to gather together. If not, we will have an electronic assembly. One way or the other, there will be a, a new bishop elected um, in May of next year. Um, and, um, and I'm in the middle of trying to noodle out what does it mean to have my time extended. The best I've been able to come up with right now is to think of this as a third term that I did not seek that um, is more like an interim. And, and what could I do to be in this in a very different posture than when I was serving as the called bishop in the first and second term? And being aware of, again, the challenges that we're dealing with right now with fires and other concerns with COVID and so forth, and how are we walking through that? Um, I, my ministry, before I was bishop, I was a parish pastor in two different congregations, uh, 20 years in my first call in Stockton, and then four years in my second call in Davis, and then I was elected bishop in 2008. Um, I'm married to Debbie. Uh, Debbie and I are, <clears throat> uh, have been creating and working with and helping to uh, form a blended family uh, for 33 years. Uh, we were both uh, divorced and full-time single parents. Debbie was completing a master's degree in education for educational administration when we were set up. Um, and we actually put the people off that were trying to set us up for a year. Um, <clears throat> kind of like, leave us alone, we're doing fine. Um, but we finally met and uh, decided our friends were right. So we were married 33 years ago um, with four children in the house the first day we were married. We had full-time custody, as I said. Um, two of those uh, children are two sons who are in the middle. They were born five days apart. They're gonna turn 40 in the next week. So we're dealing with that. Uh, one of our children, our oldest daughter, uh, Alyssa turned 40 a couple of years ago and Megan will come along in a few more years. Um, and we've been really blessed. And that has had a, a big effect on my life and ministry. How is it that God has been working in our lives as a, not typically, usually at the time anyway, when I was uh, going through seminary, I was separated and ended up being divorced during my senior year of seminary and was not at all sure how or if a congregation would be willing to call me. Um, and when I had and sought and was given uh, custody for our children, which was a decision that was made in agreement um, that I would have full-time custody of them, then how would they be able to embrace me as both a divorced person and a single parent? And, and yet did that for three years. Um, and when Debbie and I were married, um, we blended our family. Debbie um, began working in education in the same town where I was working. And, we were um, really blessed and encouraged by having these two different communities to work with. And in many cases, I was happy to be known in Stockton as Mr. Debbie Holmrud because she was far better known as the principal of these schools in the high school than the few, the hundred or so, hundreds of 300 people that knew me as the pastor of Zion Lutheran. Um, I um, uh, grew up in Southern California. Uh, a part of who I am is that I'm a ninth generation Californian. Uh, my grandchildren are 11th generation Californians. You don't see a lot of that. Um, our families, part of our family's roots came from um, Europe, Germany, and Norway and Sweden. Um, and part of our family's roots came through um, Mexico and Spain um, and colonial settlers that came here in the 1700s. And a part of what I've been dealing with in the last few years, especially, is trying to come to terms with what is it like to have been part of a family that was really colonialist, that colonized and, and desecrated the, the lands and the rights of people who were here already and trying to understand that. I got very active and very involved in the debate about the canonization of Father Hinepo Rosero and was quite opposed to that and made that known and ended up in some debates about that. But for me, it was it's really about trying to understand that history. Uh, when I was growing up, my grandmother who identified as Latina wanted to make sure I knew as much about that heritage as my other grandfather, who was Norwegian and Lutheran and Swedish, just knew me, wanted me to know about that heritage. Um, I um, am the fourth white male straight, uh, former ALC, served in the San Joaquin Valley bishop for our synod. Um, I have been saying, as we've been in a run up to the election that now has been postponed, that I hope and pray that we acknowledge the Holy Spirit has more imagination than that when it comes to uh, who we might elect as bishop. Um, and, and I thank you, Kristen, for remembering that conversation because I've, I've been aware in the last few years of my time as bishop when we gather as the Conference of Bishops of wanting to be less present and less vocal in those conversations and making room for 
others who are coming in and bringing much needed new and different voices uh, to those conversations. Um, I, I would say if people were to know me and identify me in some way, I think I, I would like to say that I notice those who go unnoticed by others and try to see what it is that I can do about raising the awareness of who it is we're not noticing, who it is we're looking over. Um, I'm aware of the fact that as a older white male bishop, um, that there are people that put on me certain things that I just kind of want to slough off. Um, I had a, an experience very early on in my time as bishop. I traveled to our companion synod in Rwanda, and I was going to meet somebody in Brussels, and we were going to fly the rest of the way together. She was involved in a ministry there in Rwanda. And I was in a jogging suit when I got off the plane, and we were coming into this terminal area, a transit area in Brussels, and she came right up to me and said, are you Bishop Mark? And I said, yes. I said, how did you know? And she said, well, you look like a bishop. And I thought, okay, there's, I'm going to have to do something about that. But that kind of bias and expectation of what a bishop looks like is something that I've been trying to live away from um, for a lot of my ministry. And it, is, it has its own challenges. I think there are times when I feel I have to work that much harder to establish my credibility as a pastor and bishop, not because of what you think I look like and should be because of that, but because of who God has gifted me to be and how do those gifts make their way out into my life and ministry. Um, I'll end with a, a story that I like to tell, um, which usually raises some eyebrows when I say the first thing I'm gonna say, which is I'm a Lutheran because of Angela Davis. <clears throat> and I'll expand on that a little bit. My, I grew up in a very conservative Republican household. Um, and in about 1963, 64, um, we were Presbyterians. And the Presbyterian Church USA donated $10,000 to bail Angela Davis out of jail because as a professor at UCLA, she had been arrested for an anti-war protest. And my Goldwater Republican parents didn't think that was what they wanted their offering money used for. And they began to be a part of a nationwide protest where people took their offering money and pooled it and put it in a special bank account and they would take the deposit slip into the pastor and say, when you get that money back, you'll get our offering money. And at some point we were uninvited to be Presbyterians. I'm not sure exactly how that happened, but we made our way into a small Lutheran congregation that had just formed a year earlier in Solana Beach. And I don't have a better story than that for how I became a Lutheran. I do know that the message of grace that I've received in that time, that I've been understanding how God works in my life in ways that I wouldn't have understand, stood perhaps in other ways has been a real gift and a real blessing for me. So thank you. It's good to be with you. Thanks so much, Mark. I, I don't want to make an assumption that we've all experienced a bias of some kind, uh, but uh, probably fair to say if we haven't personally, that we at least know someone or uh, who's close to us who has. Um, so I'm just curious as we continue uh, having this conversation for a little bit, and we're going to uh, see what questions are out there from other folks, but um, how have you experienced uh, a bias of, of whatever form of that bias might be that you would be willing to, to share? And if, if not you personally, maybe someone that is dear and, or near to you uh, that you'd like to, to share how that experience of their experiencing a bias uh, shaped you. So I'll just throw that out there and let that sit for a second. And, um, and just remember to unmute yourself so we can hear you when it's time. It's the quote of 2020, right? Unmute yourself. Um, I can, I'll go first. Um, I shared a little bit at the, about this in my introduction, but um, simply being an already young woman who presents as even younger than she is, uh, you run into a lot of bias. Um, you know, you're, uh, and being a woman uh, in, in a, uh, a profession that is still largely dominated by males worldwide. Um, you, you just run into those biases. Um, you know, we're 50 years in and it's still not unusual for me to be told that's the first sermon I've ever heard preached by a woman. And these are in ELCA congregations. And I'm like, how is that possible? Um, or, you know, you preach pretty good for, for a girl or, um, you know, various things of that nature. So that bias is something I'm, I'm pretty familiar with um, and, and deal with on a fairly regular basis. Thank you for sharing that, Kristen. Mark, 
I was going to offer, I, I had an experience where I went to a, um, a program at the Army War College in um, Pennsylvania, and it was a, a symposium that was for a week, and I was in with a cohort of mostly lieutenant colonel and colonel officers who were probably going to end up being general someday. And we were in a conversation at one point, and there were two women who were there who were, I, I thought, amazing in their, what they were offering and their insights. And every time that they offered something, and I mean every time, when someone quoted what they said earlier, they attributed it to one of their male counterparts there and not to the person who had spoken it. And I, I, I'm sure that's not an unusual experience, but I think that's an example of sometimes I think there is this way in which we don't hear what someone is saying and we assign it to somebody else that we think we probably would have heard it from in a different way. Thank you. Guy, did you want to share something or would you like to pass? You'll pass. I'd like to just share one and this is actually a, an experience I had with our presiding bishop. Uh, bishop Eaton and I, when I was in the uh, role as executive for worship, traveled quite often and quite often happened to be together at events. Uh, you know, she wearing a clerical shirt, myself wearing a clerical shirt. Um, we were at an advocacy event uh, in Washington, D.C., and I'll never forget this experience. Here, the presiding bishop of a major denomination is standing next to me, and this individual walked right up to me, bypassing her, and said, uh, oh, how nice it is to meet you, uh, bishop. And I said, well, actually, I'm not a bishop. Uh, I, this is our presiding bishop. Uh, the individual kept speaking to me and I kept redirecting. Uh, and then even when Bishop Eaton, who more than adequately holds her own, uh, you know, you know, she, she kept trying to have the conversation. It just was such blatant uh, gender bias there and probably lots of other biases that neither she nor I or that person could name. But uh, it was just really curious to me to have that very public display uh, of even our presiding bishop with me only, but and the person didn't know uh, anything about me. Uh, I just happened to be standing right next to this female person, uh, and they didn't know. Obviously, didn't know she was the presiding bishop. So it was just it was a, and that wasn't the only time that happened. I mean, that happened quite often when she and I were uh, together. And then just quickly, I would share that the other day, uh, uh, an example happened, which I think microaggressive biases happen more often than we even take into account. Uh, so Mark, you're, you were attuned to a behavior that was uh, more than micro, uh, but I was at the post office the other day um, and witnessed the postal employee show a bias to the older African-American woman uh, in front of me. Um, he, his first hand of his mouth was, um, if you don't have money to pay for that, can you please let the gentleman behind you go first? Uh, an assumption that she didn't have the uh, the money to pay for her postage, um, and and they go on and on and on and and microaggressive behaviors and micro biases I think um, sometimes can be more toxic than the the macro ones. Maybe I'm alone in that, but I I think the micro behaviors can just be super toxic. Um, I wanted to ask all of you if you would ponder this with me for a second. Uh, what have you seen individuals do that's been helpful to decrease their bias? Uh, or maybe what do you wish they would have done? And maybe by answering what, do you, what have you seen individuals do that, maybe you answer for your own selves. But uh, what have you seen individuals do that has been helpful to decrease their bias or what do you wish they would have done? I can say a little bit about that yeah. from my own perspective, what's helped me with prejudices that I have and still have about some things and is to is to actually spend more time with the people that I'm that I have these feelings about. Um, I know that I have uh, I have intentionally chosen to be with people who are uncomfortable to me at first because I need them. Um, I need to, I need to get past whatever it is on their surface or mine that uh, is a barrier, and I can't think of any better way to do it than to simply present humanly to them and to listen to them um, in return. Sometimes the gulfs between us of 
class or education or background or race are so great that it's hard to do that. Um, it hasn't, I, I wish I'd say it always worked, but, uh, but it never hurts really, I think. And, uh, and for me at least, the, the great privilege I have had in my life to be able to be exposed to people of very many different kinds um, has been a blessing and has helped me uh, avoid hasty judgment. Uh, I wish I could say I was over it completely, but, but none of us ever quite get there. And, uh, and I feel like I've come a, lot of, a long way simply by being able to be with people who are very different than me. Thank you. Mark, Kristen, you wanna weigh in on that? Uh, what have you seen individuals do that's been helpful to decrease their biases? Uh, or what do you wish they would have done? Maybe you answer that for your own self too. Um, I, I'll answer it for me. I think um, I think bias has a has an evil twin, which is called assumptions, um, and I um, have to really deal with my assumptions sometimes and how I need to break through what I expect someone. Maybe if they've said something that I draw from that a conclusion about maybe a whole lot of other things about who they are that just isn't fair or appropriate. And I think I, I appreciate what you said, Bishop Guy or President Guy, um, that I am um, um, most often wanting now to see if I can put myself next to that person in a conversation um, and see what it is that maybe I can learn or understand that I wasn't giving myself the opportunity to do before. And I, I, I have a brother um, we are as close as anybody. Um, Debbie will tell you that my voice is different when I talk to him on the phone than anybody else. She knows right away when I'm talking to him. We couldn't be any more different politically. Um, and, and there are ways in which I have worked really hard to come to a place where we can have conversations that don't end up in shouting matches and end up really where I'm really trying to understand what it is that's drawing him into this. And he's a, he's a retired sheriff's deputy. So we've had more than a few conversations about the violence that police are committing against black and brown people and how that's been a really challenging conversation. And yet, I think we've both been blessed when we get beyond what he thinks is my knee jerk liberal response and I think is his conservative bias. So. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll answer for myself as well. Um, you know, I was, I, I was raised with this idea um, that, but that my perspective as the dominant white culture was the right perspective. And um, there was this sort of assumption that anyone who wasn't cis, hetero, white um, was trying to achieve that um, if they could. So for me, decreasing biases required me to let that go um, and really humble myself um, to others, um, to be willing to learn from people, um, willing to make mistakes, uh, willing to be called on those mistakes and not go to the defensive position, um, but to sit with that and, and learn from that. Uh, and that's sometimes really painful to do. But that's, that's been the work that I've engaged in for myself uh, is, is to realize my life is so much richer when I hear these other stories from other perspectives. Um, and my life is so blessed by the relationships that I am given with, with people from different backgrounds and perspectives and ideologies and orientations and all of that. And, and I wouldn't go back to what I started with for anything. Um, I still make mistakes. I still have bias. Um, but the, the learning and the development and the blessing that has come has just been absolutely wonderful. Uh, Kristen, if, if uh, what you just said there reminded me of how, how to even how to articulate what I was trying to say about my own uh, dealing with biases and um, I um, it, it's hard to be told you're wrong uh, and it's hard to be told that you've uh, not acted the way you you thought you presented and uh, and then to be able to learn from that behavior um, and we all need truth tellers in our lives who can tell us those things especially those that uh, 
we know we're, we're going to listen to because they're going to keep telling it to us, you know. Um, I have been so fortunate, and it took me a long time to be receptive to hearing from those types of people because I, you know, I kind of feel like I, I grew up a, a bit like the way you described, you know, that uh, in that dominant culture. But I was, I also grew up with, um, you know, you, you need to do everything right. Everything needs to be done really well. Uh, don't make mistakes. Uh, and almost, almost kind of like, don't apologize. Uh, and wow, that was not helpful. <laughs> not, not helpful at all. Uh, and so, uh, you know, later in life, um, when things that I've done that have, have caused a, a bias or a hurt to another person, um, and when, what I've also learned is when I say, well, it wasn't intentional, my Lord, the, the, the things we do that aren't intentional can sometimes be the most hurtful. Uh, but when those things are acknowledged, and if we if we can sit back and put our own egos aside and listen to that, uh, there's some growth that can happen there. And that that's happened to me even, uh, not even, but quite frequently as bishop, uh, to have people who can be truth tellers to say, uh, you know, I know you, I know you might not admit it this way, but what you said came across and it was hurtful. And uh, I have I've been grateful for those folks. Absolutely, um, I really am. Yeah. yeah. So friends, with uh, all of us representing a variety of states and synods in the ELCA, and uh, Guy, even with your experience with Southwest California Synod, that's a lot of difference. That's a lot of territory. That's a lot of, of, of uh, different way people do church. Uh, it's also a lot of uh, congregations that represent uh, how we would answer in your experiences. How have you seen congregations um, do things that are helpful in decreasing their own uh, congregational biases and uh, uh, or maybe what are things that you wish that they would have done um, so mark you're the 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 person who's been bishop the longer uh, in this room so uh, i'd like to kind of start with you with that in your experience with congregations where have you seen congregations do some really good work around decreasing uh, bias i think um i'd say where they try to uh, remove some of the barriers that they put between themselves and the neighborhood or the community where they were founded uh, many years before when it probably looked very different in terms of makeup of the population and so forth um, and actually get out and try to connect and find out what's happening in the neighborhood and not make assumptions about the people that are there or the people that are living there and and that I would the congregation in Stockton which was a really challenged neighborhood there were three different active gangs in the neighborhood that regularly tagged our church and we had cries all the time from members saying we should put up fences and we should make sure that you know they can't get to our buildings and damage and i'm fortunately had some good leaders in the congregation that were willing to step up alongside of me and say no we should really be getting out and connecting out and finding out why is it that they don't see us as something more than a place where you know a church that a building that can be tagged what is it that we're not communicating about the gospel of jesus christ that perhaps would help um, us be seen differently um, in this community. And so I would say overall, there's there are a number of congregations that have not just connected with the community, but begun to invite and empower people from the neighborhood to begin making decisions about their future of their ministry. And they, they are changed by that. There is a way in which they see themselves and their neighborhood differently because they've been in those conversations. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kristen Guy, either one of you wanna to share about your areas? I'll go, thanks. Um, so, you know, despite the, the amount of geography I cover, we have fewer than 100 congregations in the Synod. So um, we're fairly rural, which means our congregations haven't necessarily had to have some of these conversations uh, because no one's moving in everybody's leaving. So there's a lot of my congregations who are kind of just riding it out till the end. Um, I do have a few congregations who are actively engaged in this work. Um, and, you know, the question that I've asked as, as a parish pastor and a question that I ask as bishop is if your congregation closed tomorrow, would your next door neighbor even know? 
Like, would their lives be impacted in any way? And if the answer is no, then you've got some work to do. Um, similar to, to what Bishop Mark was saying. So encouraging congregations um, to have those conversations. I have uh, a couple congregations that are doing low income housing um, because they have, you know, all of this land that they bought up in the 50s that they were going to build when the church exploded and it's not exploding. Um, so they've decided to do low income housing in those areas. Um, lots and lots of congregations that do food pantry, clothing closets, things like that. So they're getting to know folks. Um, I have one congregation um, where the congregation comes, they, they, they do a meal for, for homeless every week, or they did pre-COVID, they can't do it anymore. And members of the congregation come and have a meal with, with the homeless people who come to eat. So the, the homeless people are not looked at as a project but they know that they're going to be able to come and sit down and have a meal and a conversation um, with someone. And I, I think that's really powerful. Um, you know, one of the other things that we're doing from the bishop's office level is, you know, COVID has really uh, just blown everything out of the water. And there are a lot of conversations we've been afraid to have um, and with, with BLM um, getting it reignited after George Floyd's murder and, you know, these sorts of things, um, you, you, we're, we're, we're taking advantage of the chaos and the uncertainty of the time to really push people to do some important bias work. Um, and so we're offering a synod-wide um, study on Austin Channing Brown's I'm Still Here. And we have like 35 people that meet weekly, um, clergy and lay, rostered and lay, to discuss this book together um, from all over the Synod. Um, you know, so we're, we're taking advantage of things that the, the pandemic has taught us and moving it to try and challenge people, um, you know, and, and trying to, to hold relationship, I think is an important thing. Um, again, like, like Bishop Mark and his brother, help me under, you know, one of the things I, I try and coach my staff to say is help me understand why you would say something like that. Not judgmental, but here, help me understand where you're coming from. Help me understand your point of view. Um, and, and when you do that, oftentimes the defenses fall and you're able to explain your point of view. And then before you know it, you're having a conversation. Um, so that's one of the other things we're trying to do is, is, uh, address that polarity that seems to be infecting our our nation right now and say, you know, there is a lot of common ground out there um, and let's find it. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Guy, would you like to chime in there? Hope you're on mute. You're, you're still on mute. Um, while he's trying to unmute, I'll just offer that yeah. my conversations with my brother got a lot better when I stopped trying to convert him and just started listening. Yeah. Well, and uh, to Bishop Kimple, to your, uh, the work you all are doing in the Northwest Center Mountain Synod, um, the one thing I'm also grateful that that you and the uh, the rest of you have lifted up is that as someone who represents the the very deep, deep South, um, I mean, I wake up every morning and go, oh my gosh, I am the Bishop of Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, Tennessee, how in the world? Uh, but people often make an assumption, back to what uh, Bishop Mark was saying about assumptions, that, you know, these biases or this racial behavior or racism uh, or anything of that nature exist only in this part of the United States where I live. Um, and as you were saying, uh, it's it's all over. And uh, certainly, work we have to to do. Um, and in our synod here, um, I have been really proud of a number of our congregations who, um, even in the midst of this pandemic, have not shied away from, like you said, that group, those grassroots movements, uh, even in places like this, who are being attentive in in ways that 
they've not been attentive ever before. Right. Uh, and so I'm really grateful for that attentiveness. And it's hard, hard work, but it's hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, in Georgia alone, we had the killing of Ahmaud Arbery uh, and Richard Brooks uh, within just a few months of each other. And then sandwiched in between, uh, that was Breonna Taylor and uh, George Floyd. Uh, not to mention the countless other uh, brown and black bodies that go unnamed and unmentioned. Uh, yeah. So really grateful uh, that those congregations are doing that. Now they don't do that, I don't know how it is in your sentence, they don't do that without uh, pushback, um, you know. Yeah, and, and we've made it, uh, we've made it voluntary, you know. Uh, we do broad distribution, people who want to participate. We, our, our staff motto is a coalition of the willing. Um, you, you work with who shows up and hopefully more people start to show up. But one of the, the pieces that I am hyper aware of um, as Bishop out here is uh, North Idaho was home to the Aryan Nation. It was the worldwide headquarters of the Aryan Nations uh, in Hayden Lake, Idaho. And so we have incredible, and, and even though the Aryan Nations has been disbanded, um, they're not gone, they just went underground. And that's actually more terrifying because they're not operating in the light of day anymore. Um, so you see all kinds of Confederate flags around. And um, just last year, there was a, a poster in Sandpoint uh, talking about how, um, I'm gonna, I'm quoting the, the poster, uh, that Negroes are not human and we need to get them out. Um, and that was, you know, 2019 in Sandpoint, Idaho. So it, there is, it, it, it's really important that this work gets done here um, because we need to be able to speak against that because it has gone underground. And so that's, that's another reason why we're, we're actually, um, the, my assistant is doing the, the Austin Channing Brown book uh, my DEM will do another uh, anti-bias, anti-racism um, education event, and then I will also do one. Um, so we're kind of lining them up um, in different ways to just continue this message coming out of the Senate office that this is not acceptable. Um, and as as people of God, we 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 expect different. Yeah, and we put together uh, in Southeastern Senate here a diversity and justice task force. Uh, uh, we've, this Senate has, over the years, has had a number of different committees or task forces working on all sorts of different, uh, and it's been called all different things, and uh, they've had the traction, they've had the energy, and then, you know, things have fizzled. Uh, so we're, my hope in doing this uh, is that every congregation will create their own and call it whatever they want to call it. Uh, I really care less about the nomenclature. I care more about the work that's being done uh, and the intention behind it. But we've created a uh, resource paging, and much like you, uh, Bishop Kimple, you know the uh, that that culture of you know we're not trying to to talk you into something. We're we're, we're trying to uh, express to you uh, God's ultimate grace uh, and the love that that we believe God has uh, for all of humankind. Um, and in that, you know, uh, webinars uh, much like this, and uh, book studies and those types of things. Um, and, and what I find in, in the work of, of talking about bias and, and being and, and tearing down this bias work, we can't just do this when we, the energy is around it or there's a grassroots movement or people get fired up or something. Uh, I mean, it's a life's work. It's a life's journey. Um, but you have to start somewhere. Um, so to transition to that next question in the starting somewhere and knowing that as the ELCA, we're still a relatively young uh, denomination. Uh, I know age is all always relative, but um, you've you all have experienced your work in synods, and it looks like guy may or may not be joining us back. But you all have been working in synods work in your in congregational life. You've been part of this church, uh, and you've been part of most recently the work that this denomination has been doing uh, around um, helping to decrease biases. And yet we know that there's still much work to be done. So from your perspectives, what do you see as uh, things that this denomination has done uh, that you find helpful uh, to decreasing biases? And then of course, I'm gonna ask, what more do we need to still do? Or what ways do you think we need to do better? 
Uh, Guy, I'd like to start with you with that and ways you see uh, this denomination helping us decrease our bias. Sure. Um, I'm sorry about the intermittent uh, connection. I could hear you the whole time, but, uh, but lost contact for a bit. Um, I think one of our biggest challenges is the way we've structured being church as, as American Lutherans. It's not unique to the ELCA, but it's especially pronounced among us that we have made our congregations into kind of uh, entrepreneurial units that are that of people who band together uh, for the purpose of maintaining a community in a particular place. And we all know in our role as bishops how, how frequently as communities have shrunk, this becomes a, a group of people determined to preserve a presence in a building or on a, a, in a particular geography, how it becomes about the preservation of something that the group has created. So, and, and that's really destructive in a way it makes us, uh, it, it accentuates an already existing us and them mentality in which we are the people valiantly trying to keep the congregation going and they are the people who either are unresponsive to our, our appeals to them or the people we need to convince. Um, but that there's this us, us and them way of thinking. The things that the ELCA has done, I think, that help us with that and that our synods can do to help with that is to help congregations understand that they are not the church by themselves, that they are part of something larger than themselves, that in fact, the ministry that goes on outside their walls done by other people in alliance with them is also their work. So uh, all the ways we have tried to connect the work of, of the synod collectively to the congregations and to have them see themselves as part of something bigger than them, themselves has been helpful in that regard. You know, in my, in my old synod, um, fully a third of the congregations are ethnic specific in some way. And by that, I don't mean Norwegian or Swedish. I mean, they're African American or they're Spanish speaking or they're Asian, they're from one or another Asian uh, language group. And we don't have to go to non-Lutherans to find difference. When we're together in Synod Assembly or when we're working together in God's Work Our Hands Sunday, we see people not like ourselves, but who are part of what we are. And that's really helpful. It also makes it embolden some of our folks to reach out to their neighbors who are not like them because they know that there are Lutherans in other congregations who are like their neighbors, more like their neighbors than they are. Thank you. Um, I, I wonder if um, reference field, something with that um, guy said, Bishop Irwin said that, um, you know, we've had this love affair with our buildings. We've worshiped our buildings and perhaps COVID will give us the great reset we need to imagine ourselves beyond buildings. And we've had some resistance from some congregations about having to worship online. And I know there's pitfalls here. Not everybody has access to that technology. Not everybody knows feels comfortable with it or whatever else may be involved. There's economic issues as well about being able to just click a button and go. But I do think that we have an opportunity to do a great reset when it comes to our relationships with our buildings that have been insular and keeping us away from perhaps those. And I, I've heard stories, perhaps all of you have too in your synods where their attendance was maybe 25 or 30 people a week, but their online presence is yeah. much higher that they're getting people that are dialing by and staying with them or figuring things out. And, and, and I'm wondering what it is they're doing to plan on continuing that presence and connecting with, in some way, shape or form, people who've made their way in a less threatening way than walking through the door. Yeah, I ditto and amen to that. Bishop Kempel, did you wanna chime in there on what you see as helpful ways the LCA has been addressing decreasing bias? Um, I, I will say um, that the ELCA has made a lot of missteps in this work, and I think that's great because it means we're trying. Um, it means we recognize that we need to do this work, um, but we don't know how. And, and so uh, my hope for continued work around this is that we would listen to those folks who do know how to do it. Um, and are willing to help us understand how that, that works. Um, 
but you know it's hard for a person to humble themselves and say they, they don't know or they're not right or or accept that they're wrong um, it's probably equally hard for a denominational organization to do the same so um you know i i am likewise intrigued to see what impacts COVID has on on our church structures uh all throughout the the organization of the elca um and and what that means for ministry on the ground because that's really the only ministry that matters um is Amen. what happens in the streets and on the ground yeah and <clears throat> i uh I have I have seen the ELCA do a lot of things that have been helpful. I've seen the ELCA create a lot. Oh, we, we have dropped, you've dropped us. Come back, come back. But she's coming back. <laughs> We're getting a chance to see Bishop Kimple's room though. It's a lovely wall. Uh, there she is. There you are. I've seen the ELCA uh, do a lot of, of, of things. And yes, uh, I'm thankful for the attempt and I hope we've learned from mistakes or are learning from mistakes. The one thing that I'm hopeful for, though, is that when we make a decision as a denomination, especially when it's to decrease bias, I pray we stop apologizing for the decision we make. So, for instance, if we're going to say that we welcome and affirm the ministry of openly LGBTQIA people and will ordain them, then I would love for us not to spend then 10 years plus after a church-wide decision apologizing for that decision that was made. Because my intersection, what that does for me is it makes me feel like I need to apologize for my presence in a space every time I hear another person apologizing for what that decision did to this dear church. I also wanna say that when we talk about statements about authentic diversity or uh, apologies at a church foot assembly. I do not think those are um, to be just seen as just statements. I, I, I'm grateful we as a denomination are taking that. I mean, I, I really, I don't want to discount that, but it can't just be words on paper. Uh, it's got to be feet in action. And, and I put myself in that same responsible place. Um, and I still have a lot of work to do with my own self with some of the statements we made in this tenet and how we live that out. Uh, but we have a lot of mightily good intentions when we get together as a churchwide assembly, which is our highest governing body that makes decisions for this denomination. And yet I often uh, wonder if we put forth the thought into those good intentions of how we're going to live that out after the fact. Um, so when we continue to decrease bias as a denomination, it's, we can't pat ourselves on the back for a statement we make at, a, at an assembly. We have to continue taking the pat we would put our, in our, on our backs and put our hands on each other's shoulders and walk, I think, side by side to get the work done um, and, and quit all the, the apology. Because uh, apolo all that does is make people feel like you're talking out of both sides, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I, I appreciate you naming that, Kevin. I agree. Um, yeah, I, I just I want to just say I hear you and I agree with you. Um, and it reminds me of the Delaware, Maryland protest banner, thoughts, prayers, action. Um, you know, we, we've got to move beyond that thoughts and prayers crap. Um, yeah. You know, anybody can do that. Uh, uh, the church needs to do more. Yeah. We, we have a number of questions that have come in, friends. So if it's okay with you, I want to try to attend to those folks who are listening to us. Um, one of the questions is, um, let's see, although the ELC allows LGBTQIA plus to be ordained as pastors, deacons, and even elected as bishops, but individual congregations might still be conservative and not affirming. Have you experienced bias from pastors in your synod that have harmed you, and how did you solve the issues? Um, I have an answer to that, but I just got through speaking, so I want to let someone else's voice be heard. So uh, any of the rest of you would like to, to speak to that? Well, maybe I'll start. Um, I, uh, you know, you can't be the first of anything, even in a relatively progressive synod like mine, without some, some backlash. And I resolved very early on that I was going to be people's bishop, whether they liked it or not. And uh, 
and simply showed up, uh, sometimes in places where I wasn't completely welcome, but what they, where they were too embarrassed to say that I wasn't. I mean, it's very difficult to tell your own bishop that they shouldn't come. But there were some pastors who were uneasy about it, uh, both because they had made public statements that, that I, they thought they would have to repudiate, and because, in some cases, because they thought their congregations would be angry uh, with them for having me come. But uh, for the most part, I have to say those were never as bad as I expected them to be. Um, if I thought the pastor was resistant, I simply bypassed them. I mean, I acknowledged their presence there, but I spoke to their people. And, you know, they, they don't have the right to say, because I don't approve of a gay bishop, that you don't have a bishop. And, and so in most cases, the people were more willing to accept it than the pastors. I did have more difficulty with pastors than with congregations. Um, on the other side of it, there were always people who would show up and kind of sit in the back and not say anything, and then you'd never hear from them again. And they, they endured it. But, but to, be, to have a gay bishop for as long as I was, was in office uh, is a permanent change of status. And with your election, we're always going to have gay bishops, I think, from this point out. Um, people are going to get used to it. And uh, at least in that area, uh, I tried not to let it get in the way. But I know that there were, and I know, because I've heard from people as I left office, that uh, that, that made a difference. There are many people in my synod who were ambivalent or unsure about how this would all work out, who who said now that they would miss me. So um, so I feel good about that. Well, and, and Guy, I want to say thank you for that uh being the first, because you make it for me as the second uh, a little easier, uh, but also being uh, your friend over these past years of especially working at Churchwide and us communicating, you sharing those stories with me was helpful when I stepped into this role because it gave me the chutzpah I needed uh, to deal with some of that. Um, and even before being elected bishop, I was the only uh, openly uh, gay executive uh, in the Churchwide office. And I, I remember going to a churchwide assembly where I was the speaker on behalf of our presiding bishop. Uh, I was presiding and this uh, person came up to me and as I said, the body of Christ given to you, uh, they looked at me and, and said out loud, uh, not from you, and went to the bishop who was standing next to me's uh, line. And when I was elected, I had a congregation uh, be, uh, go through the process of leaving the ELCA claiming it was because I was elected. I think the real reasons are for 30 years, they've just been uh, discontent and terribly unhappy uh, with this denomination. And I pray that they found the happiness that they were looking for. Uh, but uh, Guy, I, I appreciate what you just said because that support helped me realize that I just needed to show up. Uh, and I did, I showed up because I realized I was called to be the Bishop of this Senate and pastor of those uh, pastors and and to be shepherd of these congregations. Um, and I, we've had members of congregations leave because I was elected. Um, and, and much like your own installation like mine, I mean, having to have security present um, and, you know, armed, um, you know, guards, that was a, that was a strange experience. Um, and, and yet it was a, a, a helpful thing to have even in the midst of, of that. Um, but like you, I mean, I just keep showing up. And uh, I, I finally had to come to the terms that I have been elected and for such a time as this, uh, at this particular moment, uh, which means even the people who may not agree with me, um, I'm still called to be their bishop. Um, and I'm not asking people to agree with whether I'm gay or straight. Um, I figured that out a, a long time ago, thankfully, so I don't need other people to help me with that. So. Uh, anybody else got anything to add to, to that? I want to add a follow-up, sort of follow-up question to that. This was uh, posted on uh, Facebook, but um, the person says, wondering how congregations and local spaces can make it easier for pastors, uh, and I would even add to this, if you don't mind, uh, person, deacons who are young, LGBTQ, people of color, or divorced to be accepted more and have shorter wait times for calls. Um, I know in the Conference of Bishops, this is something that we're actively working on. 
uh, in how we do assignment, but also just in how we challenge congregations uh, to not put a halt or a hold on the Holy Spirit. So uh, Bishop, Bishop Kemple, would you uh, speak to that? Sure. Um, one of the things uh, I have been trying to do um, is I try and use uh, I try and use bound conscience as a tool to get my way. Um, and, and, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But when I meet with a congregation um, to talk with them about call process, I'm very honest with the fact uh, that most of them want, you know, like a 27 year old white guy with 30 years experience and a pretty wife who plays the piano um, and two children. Um, and if that's what they're looking for, they're going to be waiting a really long time. But if they're willing to think outside of the box um, and if they're willing to uh, entertain the possibility that God could have an LGBTQ pastor or a, a, a person of color um, called to be their pastor, if they are open to that, they will have a pastor much more quickly. Um, this often opens up the door to have conversation about what their reluctance around having people of color or LGBTQ uh, individuals, I don't like how I said that, individuals who are LGBTQ. Um, this opens up conversation for us um, because they know that they can still say no to me and I'm going to let them say no to me because that's what the church allows. But because they know that, a lot of times they're willing to engage that conversation. And I had a very conservative or a very rural congregation uh, that was in the call process um, a couple of years ago. And, you know, very rural, full of farmers, um, asked if they would entertain the idea of having uh, a pastor who identified as LGBTQ. And of course, the answer was no. And I said, of course, it's your right to say that as the call committee, but could you, could you say more about why that is? And the reason they were concerned about it uh, was that they didn't want to hear about the pastor's sex life all the time. And I, I said, well, did you hear about Pastor Bob's sex life all the time? And they said, never. I said, and neither will you hear about the sex life of a, of a gay pastor. You won't. If you do, I need to hear about that because that's wildly inappropriate, no matter who does it. Um, and so we started having this conversation and they started asking questions about other assumptions that they had made about what it would mean to have a gay pastor. Um, and we were able to have this conversation. And by the time they were ready to receive names, um, they told me that they would be willing to interview uh, a, a pastor who identified as LGBTQ, um, as long as there were clear indicators that they would be a good match with the congregation. They didn't want me just to give a name um, to make a point, which I wouldn't do. I wouldn't do that to, to a pastor. Um, and I just, I thought that was a really powerful way to use bound conscience, which are so often used not as a tool, but as a weapon to enter a conversation um, around what this might look like and, and what would it be like to welcome a family that doesn't look like what we think a family should look like. Um, so, you know, those, those are some of the things that I'm doing. Um, my assistant now has primarily taken over call process. He doesn't even ask him if they'll uh, entertain the idea of interviewing a candidate who identifies as LGBTQ or a, a candidate of color. He just gives it to him um, because in his opinion, it's nobody's business and he's absolutely right. Um, you know, I, I always kind of encourage them to let those candidates know that the call committee doesn't necessarily know so that they're prepared for that emotionally. Um, or they can just say, you know what, I'd rather you told them. Um, but, you know, if congregations are willing, they, there are so many amazing pastors who are just sitting on the bench, you know, and we're talking pastor shortage and, and that's ridiculous. Um, we don't have a pastor shortage. We have a, an abundance of picky congregations um, and they're, they're picky for the wrong reason. Um, you know, there, there's a, there, I, I struggle with a congregation who'd take a substandard pastor who was, you know, cisgendered and white over a phenomenal woman of color. I, I just, I can't, 
that's, that's a huge frustration I have. So that's the work I'm doing at my level. Um, and, and Kevin is absolutely right. The COB spends a lot of time on this, but with, you know, how many of us are there? 66, 65? Uh, with that many of us, it, it takes a long time to have a conversation, so. Thank you. I, just to add uh, from my own experience here in the Senate with, with this, um, when, uh, when we're dealing with someone who identifies as LGBTQIA specifically, um, you know, I, I would never put someone's name into a place where I would feel like they were unsafe anyway. Uh, and I know you all wouldn't uh, either. Uh, but at the same time, uh, what I've done is present the candidate for the gifts they have and how that get those gifts match that MSP. Uh, and then I've let that candidate interview uh, with that congregation and said, tell the, current, tell the call committee who you are. Uh, define yourself. Uh, talk about your, your giftedness, your, your beauty, your image, your createdness in God. Uh, and uh, then if the congregation says, uh, we don't want to call that person, I always ask why. Um, and then I push on the why. Uh, I think some of this is people also need to know that bishops can push, but bishops don't, can't force a congregation to take a candidate. Uh, as, as much sometimes as I wish that were the case and we had more uh, you know, Episcopal authority or whatever, we, we don't, our structure isn't set up that way. Um, and yet what we can do is use our position of power for whatever power that is. Uh, and I think really challenge people to say, uh, as you said, you know, uh, where is your heart with this? Uh, and I don't mean just with LGBTQIA, I mean with women, uh, people of color, um, but in, until we're all willing to break a statistic, the statistic will exist. So the onus can't just be on the Conference of Bishop. It's got, it's got to be on synod laity, it's gotta be on synod councils, it's gotta be on synod staff, pastors, deacons, the whole church uh, to be able to talk about uh, this. Um, and yes, and with people with disabilities too. I mean, I, we have one person in our synod who received a call uh, who has cerebral palsy. He waited 10 years for a full-time call. For 10 years, he's been doing interims and all sorts of other di different types of things, but uh, that's another uh, area of the church that often gets forgotten. I, sorry about this, friends. I just want to keep us moving. We have about 10 minutes left, but I want to get to some of these questions because they're, they're really, uh, really good and, and hard to answer in a quick amount of time. But uh, one is, what do you see as the best approach to encouraging an awareness in individual congregations to reduce bias and the effects of white privilege? Again, the question is, what do you see as the best approach to encouraging awareness in individual congregations to reduce bias and the effects of white privilege? I can answer this fairly quickly, believe it or not. Um, modeling and calling people on their bias um, is, is a really good way to do it. Um, sometimes painful, always uncomfortable, but effective. I agree with that. One of the biggest challenges is that white privilege is so invisible in white settings and, and people can't see it. They have to, it has to be somehow um, made visible. And that we can do through, you know, a lot of, I don't want to require or expect the people of color in the, in the church to, to bear the burden of exposing white privilege to a large, to largely white congregations. So, so I've tried to do it myself in some cases, but often a book study, as, as you've done in your synod, um, Kristen, and I know a lot of other people do it, that, and other ways of learning that help people see what they couldn't see before uh, is the first step. And then once they recognize that there's more there than meets the eye, we've got, we've got the beginnings of a conversation about the impact of this on other people through their whole lives. But I think it's a really slow process in the, the settings of most of, of our congregations. And just in our, my old center, just because we had a lot of, of, of congregations of color, 
didn't really help because the ones that were largely white were were that kind of for a reason. And it was it was hard to get that first bit of learning in there. But we keep working at it. Yeah. I'd offer too that um, our our dim uh, Pastor Tita Valeriano is bringing in <clears throat> a means for a conversation for congregations acts the vitality conversation and and I we have pastors of color women pastors LGBTQ pastors in some settings that if we made assumptions they would never be there um, and it was a, maybe in some cases a dance to talk with the call committee to say my question was always. Um, not are you willing to entertain the idea of interviewing a LGBTQ pastor or a woman pastor or a pastor of color, but um, you're wanting me to find you the very best pastor that I can based on what you said you're looking for. So that's what I'm going to bring to you. These are the people that I'm going to bring to you. And that's the conversation that I hope you're able to have. But in some cases, there's still some preparation work that needs to be done, especially if <clears throat> this is a congregation that's been led for the last 30 years by one white male who that's been their only vision for ministry for 30 years and and it's not just that they were white male it's probably also that they did a lot of stuff that they should have been doing you know around the church anyway and never letting anybody else figure out their ministry so it's some of those conversations that need to happen as well thank you we have a time for a couple more uh questions i believe pastor megan then can will jump in and remind me when we're out of time but uh one person has said uh would love to know if any of you have a particular spiritual practice or centering scripture that is your go-to when bias rears its head. Um, my quick flippant answer is uh, not this coming Sunday's text, but the next Sunday when Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan, uh, would be my go-to scripture. But <laughs> uh, uh, the, what are some of your uh, go-tos? Uh, love to know if you have any particular spiritual practices and centering yourself in scripture when bias rears its head. Mine isn't uh, scripture, uh, but it's the song for everyone born. Um, that's that's my focus. Um, and it's there, there's not any wiggle room around that for everyone born a place at the table. Um, and if there's not a place for everybody, then then I don't want to be at the table. So that's that's where I go when I need to be reminded and strengthened. Mine, uh, scripturally, mine would be, uh, let the same mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. Um, and I often have to, and that and uh, Lord set a watch before my mouth. Um, you know, um, I have to, those two in tandem are usually what I pray. And uh, they offer actually a lot of, of good spiritual care. Um, and, and Bishop Kemple, to, to your point, for me, music is often my balm. Um, and so many of our hymns or even songs like that are based uh, on scripture, maybe not quote for quote. Uh, and so for me, music is really what I do. So when, when I feel like my blood pressure is rising, um, I feel like that I can tell my pulse is high, I'm becoming anxious or just, you know, downright angry. Um, there are some, there are some songs that that we as church sing or even uh, secular songs that I go to. Uh, one in partic particular, excuse me, is uh, the hymn, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Um, you know, because I have to, seriously, I mean, I have to be reminded that even in the midst of that bias, uh, I give God great thanks for even uh, in the midst of what may feel just so damn hurtful, um, God's mercy is, is just so much larger than mine. Um, I have a uh, prayer that I use every morning from the Armed Services Prayer Book, which I think, Kevin, you may have had something to do with um, uh, in your work at Churchwide. But the prayer is, Holy Trinity, you show us the splendor of diversity and the beauty of unity in your own divine life. And I need to keep praying that every day. I do, for me, that's a reminder of who God has created all of us to be. And God was significantly, um, amazingly smart in letting that diversity and unity kind of be reside in God, in the Trinity, but also in everyone we see. Thank you. I find pretty much any kind of any kind of prayer or reflection helpful. I wouldn't say that I have a, have a particular one I go to in times of confrontation. 
um, but to be part of the cycle of prayer of the, of the Western Church, to be to be uh, to be engaged in the daily office, to read from the lectionary, all those things are helpful to me because they pull them out of myself, they pull me out of myself, and link me to the cloud of witnesses around the world. But in particular, I think the the theological uh, recourse I seek is in Luther's understanding of the theology of the cross, that God meets us most authentically and most deeply and intimately in, in pain and in suffering, and that where we don't expect to find God is where we can actually encounter God most, most clearly. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes, a big, a big thank you uh, for everyone who has joined us today, particularly to all of the, the bishops who have um, shared in a very personal way, which I'm, I'm super grateful for. And I think um, one of the things that I discovered in my doctorate of ministry work was that we were in a unique time in the church because the, all of the things that the baby boomers protested for when they were young adults are all the things that young adults now are really holding up. And so I think the gift of our church right now is that those who hold the keys and make the budgets tend to agree on a lot of the same justice issues as those who are marching in the streets and fighting tear gas. And, and that's such a wonderful place for us to be. And I'm aware that I curated you all, right? And so it, it part of the reason everyone is, is as justice centered is because you have been gathered for a purpose because you have best, best practices to share with each other. But, um, but I'm going with the story that we're all on board. We're all floating down the same river that is overflowing with righteousness and justice. Um, and I thought maybe we could end our time together with a little bit of prayer because so many of the different geographical spaces that, that you all have put your time and attention and stewardship and pastoral care into are sort of under siege with, with physical emergencies and emotional emergencies. And um, would you be okay if I um, do sort of a robust prayer and then leave a little space that if you wanna put in some of the particu particulars of your space, um, that that would work and then um, I'll... Mark, would you actually close us out since you are the, the bishop of the place where my computer dwells at the end? Sure. Would Thank that be you. great? Okay, so I will start us off. Loving God, thank you for declaring that all of our diversities and complexities and intersections are fabulous. Thank you for naming and claiming us in an unremovable way. Be with us as we kick down the walls that divide us, as we go out and do ministry with our neighbors, as we claim our, our chutzpah in whatever places we have power and privilege, and as we do the work personally that we need to do to untangle the mess that we have. Thank you for being human with us and understanding this complexity. Help us to take each step a step closer to you and a step closer to the justice that we all deserve in the world. We particularly lift up this day the concerns of, of these bishops who are gathered with us, which include. God, I pray for all those who are in the storm's path, moving its way on the Eastern Sea forward through the Gulf area, for those in California, in Washington, in the West who deal with wildfires. I also give thanks for the vulnerability shown through comments that have been texted or chatted or put in Facebook as we've had this conversation this day. Thank you for each of these dear ones who have tuned in for their witness, for what they offer, and for these dear colleagues. I ask uh, God's presence with all those who are fatigued mm -hmm. by the effects of the pandemic. Give strength, O Lord, to those who falter, who, who are exhausted, who are overextended, and for whom each passing week makes this harder. 
be with all those who teach and learn as they enter into new semesters, which will be virtual and digital. Help us keep our hope in what will come. Help us build on what we learn and bring us safely through. Be with those who are sick and those who are in danger of infection and those who mourn the loss of love. I think you're on mute, Bishop Christine. There you Thank go. you again. We pray for a softening of hearts throughout our world and specifically our denomination, that those who have appointed themselves gatekeepers of the table would hear a different call, that when we proclaim with such arrogance that all are welcome, we would be humble enough to mean it, that we would be humble enough to live it. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit that dwells in those who come over and over and over again, reminding us that they have a place. Thank you for their persistence. Thank you for their anger. Thank you for the ways that they will not just let us go our own way. Make us worthy of that determination, Lord. Hold us accountable to them. For all the ways that we're experiencing life in new ways and asking ourselves, did we ever think we'd be doing this, gathering like this, using this technology, seeing each other in a new light. May we continue to be aware of how your spirit calls us to open our hearts and minds to see the world anew every day, to see each other anew and in a different way to understand what we share and when we differ, how we can talk, come together, pray, kneel at the rail, whatever it takes for us to see each other as that beautiful child of God we've been created to be. Pray especially here in California, throughout the West, for all the places that are dealing with fire, for those who are in danger of losing their homes, for those who have lost their homes, that we may stand with them and offer our support, and how this will perhaps also help raise awareness of those who have no homes to lose right now, who live without homes on an ongoing basis, and what our ongoing responsibilities and opportunities are to care for those that we often overlook among us. For those that are especially vulnerable right now, we ask that you would use us to be your presence and your peace and your hope. And we put all of this to you in and by the strong name of Jesus Christ. And through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through believing in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Mm. Thank you all for, for joining us. Um, and for uh, all of the ways that you have committed yourself to doing this work. I'm, I'm grateful to have spent this time with you. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to be with you. Take care, everybody. Bye.